Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Curious Coconut Podcast. Today, I'm joined by my co-host Tong and Nathan Lee, who is the co-founder of Stint. I met him a few weeks back at a meetup event about tech, and yeah, he seemed like a really cool person. So it's amazing to have you today, Nathan. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself and tell us what you do to our audience? Definitely. Thanks so much for having me on this podcast. So, hey everyone, my name is Nathan. I'm the current founder of Stint. We're an online employment platform helping international students build careers in Australia. In addition, I also work full time at an ed tech startup called Hex, where I lead community and partnerships. Cool. So, I guess first we'll talk a bit about Stint, and then maybe we can dive deeper into your startup journey and like what's what's your journey has been like at ed tech startup. Um, but yeah, do you want to tell us what um, what inspired you to start Stint and what was the journey like? Yeah, definitely. So um, for some context, I studied at the University of Melbourne and did a Bachelor of Commerce. So towards the end of my second year, uh, myself and my, my close friends, we were applying for internships. And um, as a domestic student, I had no idea about um, some of the challenges that international students were facing. So mm -hmm. I had a really close friend of mine who was applying to the same inter internships as me. And what I didn't realize was he was being rejected purely because of his citizenship, citizenship status. So um, they, even though he may have had um, the correct skills and experiences, just because of um, his visa status and where he came from, he was being rejected for these opportunities. So um, to me, that just didn't sit right. I didn't think that was fair. So I thought, okay, how could we develop um, a business or a sort of community project to help international students um, in their job searching journeys to sort of try and create a more equitable job landscape? So for me, it just really came out of the desire to want to help my friend and make sure that he had fair opportunities to find work here. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. That's honestly so good. Um, I'm actually an international student myself. I went to um, the University of Melbourne as well, for the ones that don't know. And I basically just fa faced the same problem. And I wish I knew about Stint earlier, actually. Um, but let's talk about your business model. Um, what is the business model for, for Stint and how did you come up with it? Yeah, so um, at the moment, we deliver three key services. So firstly, we provide an online peer-to-peer -peer support um, community housed on Slack. So this is free for both international students and employees to access and provides a variety of, of support, whether that's free CV, re free CV reviews, uh, a migration agent on hand to answer any uh, sort of general visa-related questions, we have channels specifically for events, jobs and internships, even food recommendations as well. And it's really an ecosystem trying to connect um, international students with their peers, as well as our employers as well. Secondly, we offer a job board. And this job board is unique because it only offers roles without Australian citizenship or PR requirements. So it makes the job finding journey um, for international students a lot quicker. So rather than going on conventional job sites and having to filter and try to find jobs that don't have those requirements, um, our job board is curated in, the, in that sense. And for employers, there are both free or paid options to list on this job board. So they can um, post for free or they can um, have additional features such as um, like a social media post or an email to a mailing list. And that um, comes with a $99 fee, which is fairly nominal. And then thirdly, we offer a paid placement recruitment service. So helping companies hire international students. So um, companies come to us with specific um, job descriptions, and then we go and recommend candidates from our community. And if they end up hiring um, candidates, we charge a percentage of the candidate salary package as a fee. Okay. Cool. Sounds, sounds like um, you have an amazing uh, grasp on things there. Um, I want to know, because, you know, starting a business at a young age is very hard. What are some challenges that you face going into this industry? Yeah, I think um, I, th I would say two key challenges that a lot of entrepreneurs, especially um, if you're at university starting out, uh, may face. First one being time, so time constrictions. Mm -hmm. so, so, so when I first started, Stint, I was still studying full time as well as working part-time as well. So trying to find um, 
time in my day to to work on Stint and help it grow um, was definitely challenging. And as a founder, you're, you're often a visionary, right? You have these big, lofty ambitions and dreams of how you want to see your, your business progressing in. Um, when you can't work on it full time, it's it can get incredibly frustrating when progress yeah. isn't as fast as you want it to be, or you can't uh, spend as much time developing the solution and making it as good as you know it can be. So that is obviously frustrating. Mm-hmm. Secondly, I would say resourcing. So um, as a university student at the time, I, I I didn't have a lot of money, let's be honest. And a lot of uh, <laughs> yeah. other universities students are probably the same. So yeah. the reality is um, when it came to building out a business, I couldn't hire someone to build out, you know, a fancy mobile app for me, which would probably cost north of $30,000 or... Yeah. Um, so it's just trying to find ways to um, develop this business in a low cost way that wouldn't um, use up a lot of capital, which I didn't have at the time. So I'd say those are probably two key challenges. Yeah. Like, yeah, that honestly sounds like a lot. Managing university, part-time work, and then also having a startup and trying to scale it up. What What are some strategies you use? Because I'm, I'm kind of bad at time management. Yes. Um, so do you have any like strategies that you like to use? Trust me, I'm still working on it. But <laughs> yeah. I would say the biggest thing for me is definitely my calendar. Yeah. So um, I combine a lot of my calendars into one. So I combine my work calendar, I combine my personal calendar, and I combine my um, stint count calendar as well, just so that it aggregates all my events and I can see, okay, mm-hmm. I have this on each day. And using things like color coding, for example, so mm-hmm. it, it's a lot easier to, to break down really quickly. And if it's not in my calendar, I am 100% going to forget about it. So yeah. it's developing a routine where as soon as something comes up, no matter how small, I'm putting it in my calendar. Even if it's something like a, like a dentist appointment or going for a walk or or calling my parents, stuff like that. <laughs> so that wow. So I'm sure that I'm maintaining a balance still because even yeah. though there's a lot of moving parts in my life, I still want to have a have a good work-life balance or uh, aspire to. So I'd yeah. say that's probably my, my key strategy at the moment. No, I I love to hear that, you know, going for a walk and having time to call your parents. Um, yeah, you can you can get so lost in managing all of those things. So yeah, definitely put on you for doing that, I guess. Going going back to Stint though, I was just wondering, um, what is what is it what is it in it for the uh, employer that basically goes to you to 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 find um like employees? What's what's in it for the employer since um, they they are the ones that have to eventually um, sponsor a working visa for the international student. For sure. So for international students, they have a lot of benefits, as you know. So um, coming from a different country, they will have an understanding typically of, of that culture or that market. So if a company has offices or has clients uh, in that market, it's always helpful to have someone who has an understanding of uh, the local customs and everything like that. In addition, language, so being multilingual is a massive plus. So again, if they have clients in in, in that country per se, um, having someone who speak that language um, and understands as well the Australian um, working landscape is just um, so beneficial. Uh, And, you know, after graduating, international students do have um, a a visa where they can work unrestricted hours for for a number of years. And depending on where where you're working um, or where... Also, what sort of visas you're on, you know, it can vary from two, two, two years um, upwards as well. So there is still an extended period of time where the employer can have this international student in their business, have them contributing, bringing their unique skills and experiences into the business without having um, the need to sponsor. And if the business feels like the international student is contributing enough for them to want to sponsor, then they always have that option as well. But again, like two, two three years time, well, two years time is the typical or is the minimum is still a, a significant period of time for them um, to really understand whether this international student is providing something that's unique to the business that they couldn't find elsewhere. So there, there definitely are options and different pathways for an international student to stay um, in Australia long term. And for the employers, they're getting someone with um, some really unique some some u- really unique characteristics that they may not get um from the local market and i don't think it comes uh there's i don't think it's a domestic student or international student debate here 
I think it's mm-hmm. both very separate and for, for different jobs there, they may be better for, um, yeah, for, for, that, for that job. But I don't think, yeah, there needs to be an argument in that case. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And having worked on this project for a while now, Nathan, um, are there any su- success stories that you can talk about that has happened through um, the user stint? Definitely. So um, we're really lucky at Stim. We've built up um, a really strong community, um, currently sitting at just almost 3,000 international students across oh, wow. Australia. That's great. So yeah, it's, it's, it, is re- it is really good. And I'm really happy um, that we're able to build this really vibrant community. Um, and we've been able to help a number of international students find jobs as well. So a few that come to my mind, uh, we had um, a real estate company come to us looking for uh, a marketing assistant who spoke Mandarin. So again, like I touched on before, having that really curated, validated candidate pool, it really helps when trying to pick out um, really specific candidates, such as like someone with a specific language requirement for these companies. So we're able to um, connect them with an international student um, from Malaysia who was um, studying marketing at the time and help him land this job, which was really cool. We've also had employers join our community as well and um, simply just reach out and see if there's anyone interested in like internships, for example. We've had a number of international students get internships through that way as well. Yeah, no, that sounds amazing. Um, I'm curious to know, like, how were you, how did you grow um, up to 3,000 uh, students? Because, you know, sometimes I even struggle to arrange a meeting with some friends. You know, they, it's it's so hard to build a community. Um, so I'm just curious, what was your process like for that? It, it, it was a, it was a long process. It definitely didn't happen overnight. Yeah. I think for us to get our first a hundred members, it took us, I think three months initially, but mm-hmm. then we got to the point where we did a hundred members in like six, seven days. So it, it is a really funny one, but I think it's understanding where your customers are. And for us being international students, it was university. So making mm-hmm. sure we had a really strong presence at university, uh, yeah. whether that's putting posters up, whether that's um, having booths at orientation or orientation week, but also a, a key a key one for us was running events. So running events that provided a lot of value to these international students. So focusing on key areas that they knew, that we knew, they would be interested in things like um, CV workshops, mock interviews, uh, networking events. And we ran so many events this year and in previous years as well. And that has really helped us boost um, our community and develop a really loyal following with a number of international students coming to um, our events on a regular basis because they know that um, what we're able to deliver is really valuable and really insightful from not only our own experiences, but bringing in our industry connections as well to um, mm-hmm. provide international students with um, some really helpful advice. Yeah, for sure. I feel like as long as you have a quality product, one that offers good value to to your users, I think the numbers just talk um, for themselves. Um, do you have any visions for the future, um, for, for Stint, that is? So many, so many. I think <laughs> I see so much potential in STIN and what it can and its role as a bridge between international students and Australian employers, really helping bridge that gap, which has oftentimes been so large. So for us, there's a few um really key things that we want to um achieve in the near future. So we um are building out a digital talent pool. So um, international students can create accounts, can create a professional profile. And that way, when we're doing the matching process between employees and international students, it's a lot more seamless and less manual. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, we want to continue improving our job board and get to the point that something like Seek, Indeed, Grad Connection are, but specifically for international student roles. So that's sort of what we want to do. And obviously growing our um, recruitment agency sort of arm of the business and working with more employers to um, help them hire international students from our community. Yeah, I think that's that's a great vision because international students, they already have so many struggles when they come to Australia and Mm. finding a job and like a respectable job can be quite hard. So if they have like one source of truth where they can find workshops um, as well as like job opportunities, uh, I think uh, is, is, is amazing. 
one question I have, this might be a bit controversial, but you know how Australian, I feel like international students and you know, universities, uh, like international universities consider international students almost like cash cows. And, you know, peop sometimes it's, it's thought that, you know, they don't necessarily want the international students to stay in Australia. Hmm. Um, so do you think it's hard on purpose for them um, that like the Australian government doesn't want international students to stay in Australia? It is a really big problem, and I will say it's a systematic one that flows that trickles down from um government. So I think universities aren't always incentivized to focus on um outcomes post graduation, especially for mm -hmm. international students, um because for for so long um obviously international education has been a massive export, and Australia's already developed um a really strong reputation. Um, as a destination for international students from across the globe. So because of that, I feel like universities are quite assured in terms of their position. And um, numbers predict that there will be um, a close to a million international students studying in Australia by 2025. So when they see those numbers, they're like, okay, we don't have to change anything because the number mm. of international students is just going to keep increasing. Uh, so I think there does need to be some significant changes when it comes to um, the employment outcomes post university. Uh, I think the number for the University of Melbourne in terms of international students finding jobs after graduating is around 40% from um, memory. So it, it is quite low and overall the uh, employment rate of international students is 25% lower than domestic. So there is a lot of work to be done and some, some significant changes need to be made. And I will say there are definitely people within universities that do care about international students and do champion the value of international students. But it's incredibly difficult when you have institutions that have been around for so many years and have not changed. So uh, there's a lot of red tape, a lot of bureaucracy. And when it comes to making uh, really rapid change, it's unlikely when it comes to universities. But what we, what we really want to be doing is working really close with universities to offer um, our support services to their international students because everything we offer on the international student side is free and we don't charge universities when we work with them because we really just do care about the the um the journeys of international students and helping them build careers and lives here in Australia. So we really want to be that bridge and help them um, create better outcomes for their international students after graduating. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. Hopefully... Um, you know, you guys are quite successful and you can uh, provide a clear bridge um, for international students after they graduate into the job industry. Um, but yeah, moving on, let's let's talk a bit about your journey at Hex. So do you want to tell us uh, what your role is at Hex and how, how your experience has been there so far? Yeah, so I currently lead community and partnerships. Um, so for those, and for those who don't know what um, community and partnerships is, what I basically do is lead our um, digital community. So very similar to what we built at Stint, we also have um, at Hex as well. Mm -hmm. So um, how I actually did get the job was because of my experiences at Stint and sort of what I was able to build there. So I've taken a lot of the skills I've learned from building Stint and transferred them over, over to Hex as well. So um, I've been building that digital community. We're currently at um, 1,500, which is really, really good. I also work to support um, our alumni. So mm -hmm. um, Hex has over 10,000 alumni globally. Yeah. So um, making sure that we're continuing to support them, continuing to champion their, their um, success and career progression as well. Uh, and on the partnership side, I work with high schools, universities, and corporates to help um, part, help them partner with Hex and um, try to create win-win outcomes for, for for both parties. And I don't think I've touched on it yet, but basically what Hex delivers is um, online and in-person innovation educational experiences. Mm -hmm. so, um, our flagship program is a two-week program where we take university students to startup hotspots across the globe, like Singapore, Vietnam, uh, previously in Silicon Valley and Tel Aviv as well, and teach them how to build a startup. 
and that is university accredited. So imagining, imagine knocking off um university subject in two weeks while getting to travel and also build a, build a business. It's a pretty cool value proposition. Um, but since COVID, we've also developed some some digital products as well. So we've developed five digital courses, um, and we deliver them in six week cohorts, which is which is mm-hmm. also um university accredited as well. So, um, what we're really trying to do is um embed these innovation experiences into the, the pre-existing um, educational pathway. So whether you're a high school student or a university student and you want to sort of explore things outside of your classroom or outside of your, your degree, you're able to do um, a HEX experience and learn all about the world of entrepreneurship or innovation or futurist thinking or tech or all that sort of stuff. Honestly, that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, like especially the global experience program. <laughs> if I had known that about that during university, I, I definitely would have done it. <laughs> I thought you the exact same thing as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean that's that's the reason why I joined Hex because for me, what they were doing was something that I wish I had when I was at university or in high school as well. So being mm-hmm. able to contribute to that and help um others who are a bit earlier in their journey really open up their eyes to all the possibilities in this world that um uh are beyond you know the linear career progression pathways all the really conventional jobs um is really is really cool wow seems like you're juggling a bunch of things aren't you nathan <laughs> yeah i i'm definitely someone that likes to keep myself busy um i think i fall into the mindset of i always want to try and be productive in my time so whether that's in my full-time job or outside of it with stint um i don't like to be too free because i don't mm-hmm. know what myself in yeah, so I like having a lot of things going on at once. Not too many things because I want to make sure the things that I am doing, I can do well and give 100% to. But um, I definitely not want to take it too easy. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with that. Like sometimes I feel guilty when I'm just having fun. Like um, I, it's like I don't deserve to have fun. I'm not, I haven't done anything <laughs> to achieve, um, earn it. Um, So I definitely agree with that mindset. Um, But yeah, are there any things that you have learned at Stint that you transferred over to Hex or the other way around? Because both are like startups. So I'm assuming there's some sort of overlap between them. Yeah, there's so so many transferable skills and experiences from both jobs actually. And as a first time founder, I found it really beneficial to actually be working in an early stage startup Mm -hmm. while building a business. So Hex is a little bit further along where they've raised um, a pre-seed round 1.25 1.25 million so um it's a it's it's further along in its sort of startup journey and because of that i can really observe in its growth and how the founders are managing the team how they're um, developing strategy what sort of tools they're using and really pass that back on to um my role as co-founder of stint and it's something that has i found really beneficial because i think sometimes the mindset with found is is that it's all or nothing or you have to go all in but Mm -hmm. when it when it came to me I wanted to take more of a measured approach because I understood that the reality is stint won't be the only business or it likely won't be the only business that I build um in my lifetime so I really wanted to take the time to understand and how to how to successfully build a startup and give myself the space and the the chance to make mistakes and learn from them if i was all in on stint work doing that full time and nothing else there would be an incredible amount of pressure on me to succeed and not make mistakes and that would be incredibly hard and quite toxic in all honesty Mm -hmm. so because i have um a full-time job which is able to help me pay for things like rent or groceries and you know all those sort of things yeah yeah i am able to take my startup journey with stint a bit slower and um i have more room to make mistakes and learn from them Mm -hmm. and so i think that is something that if you are thinking of starting a business don't feel like you have to do it just full-time there are other ways for you to sort of balance that and a full-time career as well and yeah there there are so many things that you can learn from building a startup that you can translate to a full-time job and vice versa. And it's definitely something I would recommend. I, I feel like it's helped me grow exponentially in the past um year or so that since I've started Stint. Yeah. Like 
the normal saying goes like don't quit your daytime job until your business is successful so i think i think there's reason behind that um but yeah one thing one other thing i want to ask is like usually um companies don't want someone who's working at their own startup you know some because they're like we're going to put all this time and effort into this person but they're just going to leave us if the business if their own business goes well um so i'm quite surprised that you know you're able to find a f- part-time job um and still like when they knew i guess i guess the reason for that was that you were already working on a similar project um so you were able to help the startup with uh their own community and partnerships program yeah it's it is a funny it is a funny one my startup well my work at hex they actually prefer hiring people with side hustles oh okay That's and because of that it it shows a lot about the person they're hiring things mm-hmm. like they're really hard working they're able to manage and balance their time they have an entrepreneurial mindset they're able to overcome challenges and because of that um hex just really likes hiring um founders or people with side hustles and it's also beneficial because a lot of the stuff we do at hex or our flagship um experiences are around helping university and high school students um build their own businesses so because i've had experience building my own startup i can use a lot of the learnings that i have and translate that to when i'm supporting um the people who are going through our programs as well mhm yeah it's really such cool. an interesting way yeah it's such an interesting way to think about it i i never thought about it that way um i think the people at hex are probably doing something right I think that's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um I just wanted to ask you Nathan, there's so many um young people that aspire to be entrepreneurs um mm-hmm. or start their own businesses. What is a piece of advice that you would give them? Yeah. I think sometimes people perceive the barriers to entrepreneurship to be too high, whether that's money, that's time, that's technical skills. So I just want to sort of debunk some of those myths and say that um I built stint without any technical skills I don't know how to code we've built it on pretty much um we built it pretty much for free um we haven't spent a lot of money um on building out stints and that's um yeah been been really cool to see and lastly time as well obviously I've been out of juggle um building out stints as well as you know jobs or university um so i think it's just understanding that there are a lot of ways a lot of different ways to become an entrepreneur and that everyone's path is different so um in terms of technical skills how i overcame that is i was able to find friends or uh people within university societies who had those sort of technical skills and wanted experience to put in their portfolio and therefore they are able to volunteer their time to help stint and build out some of the technical technical um things that we needed such as um our website or our job board mm-hmm. in terms of building a startup at a very low cost um we were able to leverage a lot of free tools out there things like slack for our community uh initially we built our website on a low code um platform and um there's a lot of still there's a lot of manual stuff that you can do um when you're still starting out so things like our recruitment service we um essentially just drafted you know the necessary contracts and all, all the legal um collateral that that's required and then we did the process manually we're in the process of building something to sort of automate that process but when first starting out a lot of the stuff that you want to do that you would like you know an app or a website to do you can actually do it manually as well at and that way it would save you a lot of money and help you develop the capital that's required to then go out and pay someone to build it or you know mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff yeah yeah uh one thing i want to know is that i think on your profile on your linkedin profile i saw that you also worked done some internships at corporates right um so how's how's like that experience compared to working at a startup would you say yeah so i i i would definitely say when i was at university um i fell into the trap of following the herd so yeah. um naturally the linear pathway um after university is to go on to you know a really prestigious firm do um the 9 to 5 and for me i was doing accounting and finance so 
um, your big four like KPMG, Deloitte, PwC, and EY uh, was naturally sort of the next step for me. So even at the time, I would say I was definitely more interested in entrepreneurship and startups. I wasn't sure if I could build a career there. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of things about startups that um, scared me. Things like they pay a lot less or um, the tech layoffs. And so for me, I was like, okay, maybe the smart choice for me is to do the corporate route and build my startup on the side. So I did do an internship at Deloitte over um, summer break after my second year. And it was okay. It, I definitely, I, I think I quickly learned it wasn't for me. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing to say, nothing to like go against, you know, people who want to go down that path. But uh, I think it lacked the dynamism that I was looking for. So being able to do something different every single day, um, it was hard to, um, joined such a large organization um because it felt like I was just you know a small cog in a big machine yeah and, yeah um regardless of the work I did you know Deloitte was still gonna still gonna be okay so uh those are some of the challenges that I faced when I when I was working there and um I felt like then you know after I scratched my corporate itch startups was 100% going to be uh, my way forward and what I wanted to do full time after leaving university. So it was, it, I definitely say it was an important thing for me to do and understand um, whether corporate was for me on was was for me or not. Mm -hmm. And without doing that, I would have always had that question in the back of my mind, oh, you know, sh should I work corporate or, you know, because there were definitely some benefits for working corporate. There was a more structured training program. I had a buddy who sort of supported me. They have a lot of professional development opportunities. Mm -hmm. The network in terms of the people you meet is so much larger because you're working in a company with thousands, tens of thousands of employees globally as well. Um, so there are definitely a lot of benefits. It just depends on what sort of priorities you have at the moment. Yeah. And for me, um, being in my early career, I just want experience I want to be um, given more responsibility than I may be deserving of because of my age or my level of experience. Yeah. I want the opportunity to travel. I want the opportunity to work in an area where I'm passionate about. So yeah. I think a lot of those things aligned with, with Hex and which is why I joined there full time over um, going back to corporate, which I definitely had the opportunity to post my internship, but I, mm -hmm. I chose to go startups. Yeah, no, I, mean, I think it's a good experience for sure. I mean, that's um, what, what they like to say, right? Uh, like in your 20s is the, like the perfect time to just try a bunch of things and, and fail. And if things don't go right, you just pick yourself back up and yeah, see what you like, see what you don't. Yeah, 100%. I, I would say consider, well, from what I've learned so far, consider your early career like an experiment. Mm -hmm. Test your assumptions, have hypotheses. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to make mistakes and try different things. So um, I've definitely developed sort of what they call a scientific mindset when it comes to my early career, just seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work and looking at why things work or didn't work. And I think if you remove that fear of failure or that fear of not always being right the first time, I think you'll find that you have a lot less pressure on yourself and that um, you have more freedom when it comes to really enjoying your work and testing out new things yeah yeah for sure i think in in right out of university it's it's not as important to just you know get a job it's more important to explore the things you like and figure out what you want to do in the future um but yeah i think we're coming to a closing soon so i want to ask you like a few final questions but one of them one of the questions we always like to ask is what fascinates you about the future this could be related to tech or just anything, you know, that excites you? Yeah, I, I, I am excited to see better pathways for students to pursue entrepreneurship um, as mm -hmm. part of the university degree. So there was this um, legislation that um, was going through government this year called Startup Year. Okay. And basically giving universities um, the opportunity to um, essentially create better uh, entrepreneurship pathways for their university students whether it's investment, whether it's um, subjects more aligned to entrepreneurship, 
So um, our CEO was really lucky to um, be at the Senate and deliver her opinion and her sort of thoughts on on this sort of legislation. And it's something that it's going to be really exciting for future um, students who are interested in pursuing entrepreneurship so that, you know, they don't have to, you know, choose between entrepreneurship or completing a university degree. They can do both at yeah. the same time. So I think that's going to be really cool um, in terms of giving students that that flexibility and not giving them like an ultimatum. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited for um, our budding entrepreneurs that are coming through the ranks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, also, we at the Curious Coconut, we, we love to read. Um, do you have a favorite book by any chance? Or is there, if, if you do, if you, if you have a book that you like, um, which one could you rec recommend to our listeners? Or if you don't like to read, do you have any like audio books or something that you listen to that you can recommend? Yeah, unfortunately, um, when since I've been quite busy, I haven't read any books recently um, or listened to many podcasts. Um, I, 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 it's been interesting. I, I've definitely wanted to explore that sort of self help improvement books and and podcasts, but I've never gotten the chance to do that yet. I've always mm -hmm. been someone who has tried to be a lot more hands on when it comes to my learning. So um, I guess instead of reading a book or um, listening to a podcast, I would probably just um, work on Stint or do some <laughs> effects and, and learn from that instead. Yeah. So, yeah. If I'm curious about something, right. I would probably just experiment it myself. And if I needed any advice, um, I have mentors or I have my colleagues or my co-founders um, to go to go for that as well. So um, I've been at really lucky. I've developed a really strong support system around me so i'm able to leverage them if i have any questions or need any advice oh that's okay. that's amazing to hear yeah but yeah for for our, i think this is our that was like the last our last question uh nathan is there anything else you'd like to say to our audience you know where they can follow you or if they should join the community or any any other links that you'd like to plug yeah if you if you if you're interested in anything i've talked about so far definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I use that platform probably too much. And <laughs> so yeah, you can definitely find me there. If you're interested in Stint, you can visit our website at www.stintcommunity.com. And if you're interested in Hex, you can visit our website at www.startwithhex.com. Sounds good. Well, it was lovely to have you, Nathan. Um, and yeah, good luck with Stint and with Hex. I wish you all the best. And we'll put all the links that you mentioned in the description. So anyone who's interested, they can check you out. Amazing. See Thanks you. so much for having me on, guys. Yep. Thank you. Yeah.